Good evening. My name is Karen Kooni. I'm the director of the Vera List Center for Art and Politics. And really, really pleased to welcome you to the third seminar in a series um, about boycotts. Um, the series is called Assuming Boycotts. It's not an endorsement on our behalf of cultural academic boycotts, but it's an acknowledgement that we are facing today a um, extraordinary number of boycotts. And whether we engage with them or not, we ha have to somehow acknowledge that they exist and um, influence how we um, operate ourselves in this cultural field. Um, we began in September with a historical survey of the impact of the cultural boycott of South Africa during apartheid. And it was really interesting to have a number of historians speak about the outcomes of it and the effects, one of them being the um, result of a, or the emergence of a kind of a new um, uh, musical genre of very um, innocuous, um, domestic, a seemingly apolitical music and, or songs that were clearly a response to the culture boycott. Another um, aspect of it was that some of the speakers pointed out was the um, determination of South Africa to be connected with um, Northern Europe or Western Europe and Northern and the US. And this desire meant that the impact of the boycott was that much greater because South Africa was hurt in a very vulnerable position because that is what it wanted to do, supposedly, at least the leadership. Um, the second event uh, took place about a month ago and um, addressed the situation in Palestine, Israel, where one of the speakers, the main speaker, Tirat Solgader, spoke about the indecisiveness of, um, or indeterminacy of art that allows you to make pronouncements that cannot necessarily be interpreted as being political, but they're still there and out there in the world. And today, we are looking at what we have labeled um, very roughly kind of long distance um, engagement, meaning that in this time of boycotts where we disengage with certain areas or institutions or countries, um, by the same uh, token, we also want to engage with other or similar situations, countries and institutions but need to look very carefully and very precisely at the rules that regulate and that um, ethically are um, imposed on us when we do so. Um, I want to thank Laura Rajkovic very much. She has been the, or continues to be the co-curator of this series. She is the newly appointed director and president of the Queen's Museum. And we'll also continue um, coordinating and curating the series. We have two more events in the spring and we'll end with a um, conference on, I think it's mid-April, April 10th and 11th. In your programs, you have more information about the other seminars and you have a mistake. The second last one on new forms of institutions um, created or emerging in association with these boycotts is actually on February 23rd and not February 2nd. So just please make a note of it. Um, the format of all of these seminars is such that we have a more intimate afternoon or late afternoon session as we are about to enjoy now. Then there's a break and at 6.30 or 7 tonight at 7 o'clock we um, usually um, anticipate and receive bigger audiences and a more public conversation. Uh, Laura will introduce the speakers and we'll also frame the discussion and moderate the Q&A afterwards. But I quickly want to express my deep appreciation to Molly Kleiman and to Ava Ansari, who are the first presenters um, and will, I think, organize us in some kind of social way. <laughs> so I don't know, Laura, do you want to say a few words first? Or no, I think we should just... Okay. Yeah, yeah, we should start. Okay, great. So thank you very much for coming. Hi. So thank you uh, to Karen and Laura for inviting us. Uh, we're honored to be part of these conversations. Um, so Ava and I uh, together are co-curators of a project called The Back Room, which is a pedagogical and curatorial project that uh, facilitates exchanges uh, through workshops, public programs, and exhibitions between artists and writers in Iran and the United States. Um, and before we... Um, 
show you any media or go more into depth about our own practice, we wanted to share with you a question that was sort of plaguing us this past, not plaguing, obsessing us, this past yes. eight months, <laughs> four years. Um, and uh, hopefully we can, since we're in more intimate group, would it be possible for people to come a little bit closer so we're all gathered closer to the front? And ideally sitting next to someone else or in a, a few others? Thanks. I just also want to, wanted to say hi, everyone. Hello. <laughs> So, okay, so we basically came here for, uh, to be with you guys uh, with a question, to start the session with a question. And the question is how you uh, envision a classroom and what is a classroom for you? What does it mean to you? So if you are uh, sitting somehow next to someone who you can maybe talk to about this, that would be great, so you can just share your ideas and thoughts of what a classroom is. And then we will share thoughts together in yeah. two minutes. So you can just go for it for two minutes. What is a classroom? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Finish that thought. maybe share with us what came out of that conversation? I've organized people to work as teams. I've organized people to work as teams for, for, for many years. Like for example, I take something like Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I get 30 to 60 people together of any age. It could be four years old, they don't even know how to read. Um, I put them in the, in the chapters by the number of characters in each chapter and, and, uh, and I have each small group present their chapter any way they like. They could do it as a play, they could, somebody could narrate it, they could do it as a dance or a mime, or they could throw out the chapter and improvise it, you could edit the thing up or down, and whatever, whatever the, your skills are. The only objective is you have to make everybody laugh. It's great fun, I've done it many, many times. Well, I organized a, 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 a uh, a, a, um, a program in Connecticut uh, with, through the Department of Labor where I took the people on unemployment insurance, receiving unemployment insurance benefits and stratified them by skills, education, years of career experience and that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> and I, I uh, uh, divided uh, the people who came to, to my workshop, which was about 100 people, and uh, I divided them into uh, small teams of three to five people with a common business market focus. And I led those teams through the process of analyzing their business market, looking for unserved or underserved market wants uh, for which they could position themselves. Um, you know, if you, if you go to an, uh, an employer with an analysis of the f employer's firm, he's going to be far more interested in talking to you than if you just present your resume. Right. The whole idea is to organize schools to organize their kids into teams. Kids know how to work as teams. If a kid, uh, if you have a, a team of kids and the kid, the team needs a good math person, well, that team has to prove to the good math person so that they're worthy. Be, uh, the, a classroom being a place that is about teamwork and exactly. laughing. And exactly, exactly. And so. Thank you so much. <laughs> so other people can add as well. Um, so yeah, so that it involves teams, laughter, uh, and maybe un unusual environments as well, not only in a traditional classroom um, setting. <laughs> so did anyone else uh, think about maybe a different conception of what a classroom might be or other examples that came to mind, maybe from your own work also? Yeah? Um, our conversation was more our Yes, what we, what we would like a classroom to be. And uh, I suggested, and I'm also working on a project that explores exactly these um, problematics. Um, a classroom should be a place to learn together, 
where maybe the, the learning is more horizontal. There is not clear definition who is a teacher, who is a student, but we are a collective learning body. And we can learn from each other. We can learn in different ways and so also different subjects. And um, I was wishing for a more yeah, multidisciplinary kind of approach and also an approach that involves our senses and not only our rational, cerebral way to articulate. And then there were examples about uh, how our kids are forced into the class, the, the classic classroom, and how knowledge is normally organized, and how scary is that? So at the <laughs> I think there's a lot of forms of a classroom, but we think of the pedagogical person in the front and the 30 young people who are all segregated by age, and they're not multi-mixed, and they're always in the square room, and they're always facing the front. But there's so many more forms for the space of a classroom, which could be outdoors or the, or the grouping. Mm -hmm. So to me, it sounds like everybody was kind of talking about different acts of learning or different acts of teaching or different principles that that space is limited by or defined with. True. Yeah, anyone else have um, uh, something else that hasn't been brought up yet that they wanted to add to this definition, this evolving definition? Um, I didn't. We didn't talk that much about what it, uh, what we would like it to be, but a, a bit more about the reality. I'm just coming from a classroom from, I think the neighborhood is called East New York, um, at the end of the L. Um, I'm teaching an after-school film workshop there, and mm. when you describe uh, these far-flung political and geographical spheres, I think um, that part of Brooklyn um, belongs to that. Um, uh, it's incredibly, uh, it's a very classical setup, it's a very beautiful school building actually, and very uh, uh, kind of normal classrooms, but to actually reach and motivate these children, um, is incredibly difficult, and uh, I mean, I could go on and list the the many reasons why it is so. But I think really connecting with them and and motivating them mm, is only one aspect. Yeah. But to 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 actually be able to communicate is is uh, something that is often lacking. Yeah, it sounds like you bring up something too about the the norms of the classroom not necessarily serving all student bodies, um, and that, yeah, there's the certain conventions, as you were describing, of the 30, the 30 seats all facing front, that they're especially ill-fitted to certain, uh, certain communities of students. Yeah, even if it's just uh, seven students and not even 30. Yeah. I mean, it's very, very, very far, far removed politically, uh, geographically, and uh, emotionally. Thanks. Um, so I think from there, that's a really good place to transition. I'll grab this for Anna. <laughs> Free labor. Okay. Um, so we've been thinking a lot about this, uh, what, what constitutes a classroom um, in terms of the physical spaces, the, the discourse that can take place between students or teachers or any individuals in a peer-to-peer -peer situation. Um, and how we might define these spaces without having a set of walls within which all of the participants are contained. Um, and this has been central to our work over these past four years together as the back room. Um, and even the name, the back room, it is uh, related, of course, to an architectural space when you think of a physical room. But um, the, we want to also share the sort of genesis of the name of the project because it seems um, relevant to what we're talking about, what a classroom might be. So it sounds really uh, crazy to think about a space that you want to work with different uh, actual geographical places within that space. So for us, that was like the idea of how we want to create such a space that we are able to connect with all these different places, but still make sure that we are not only defining what this might mean as the sole uh, definer of it. So based on the personal experience that I had living in Iran since four years ago, the idea of this back 
spots or places in galleries, nonprofits, or art spaces where you can go and with you, your colleagues or people who are sharing same interests to see what you want to see or uh, talk about what you want to talk about and um, have fruitful, uh, inspiring discussions. Those are spaces that could be like a um, balcony of a gallery when you just go out to have a cigarette. Or it could be the uh, empty pool of a gallery owner's house, which is dedicated for this kind of conversations for artists and uh, curators. And for collectors to go and see works that they're not able to see in the um, defined uh, set up of what an exhibition might mean. Maybe also share uh, what are the, some of the constraints living and working in Iran? Because I think you assume that we all know, but we not everyone does. So yes, this might give you a better idea of what is the situation that we are talking about. So I'm coming from a place, a uh, country, Iran, that you might know about, but you might not also know about that much. So just to give you an idea of the definition of public and private, dancing in a public space in Iran is illegal. So the freedom of body movement in your space is very much depends on uh, how the uh, principles and uh, regulations of that country allow you to perform that. This is just uh, something that I wanted to share with you because I thought this would give you an idea of what is the kind of situation we're talking about. Not to want to romanticize it or exotify it because there's so many places in board that are like that but I just wanted to put it out there so you understand what I'm talking about, those back rooms, how they're kind of temporarily shaping and how they might, dis might dissolve and who are the people and how they're getting together to make it happen or create it. So um, in order to create this, these spaces, uh, when, Ava, when we first met and Ava was describing these temporary safe zones that would occur, um, often in the periphery of um, other cultural activities or in uh, private domestic spaces, um, anywhere that blurs sort of a public and private environment. Um, I was really amazed to hear about these spaces also still existing and how do you even know who to invite in? How do you maintain a sense of trust, build a sense of trust? And um, so we were thinking about how, um, how could we from here um, over a huge geographic divide, over the divide of visas and restrictions for travel and the expense of travel, how can we provide um, other s safe spaces that could connect these various backrooms that are already existing? So rather than uh, creating a classroom that we then import <laughs> to Iran, open up channels that could expand the classrooms or backrooms that already exist. So we were interested in thinking about this sort of um, immaterial and expanded back room. Um, so this, what we wanted to share with you today, uh, focusing again on this idea of the classroom, was um, uh, comes out of an eight-week workshop that we organized this spring uh, in collaboration with Culture Hub, which is a center for um, uh, art and technology here in downtown Manhattan. And um, actually, uh, Laura Reykjavich was one of the um, participants as well, um, coming into two of the sessions and helping facilitate the conversation. And it was a, a three-channel uh, telepresent workshop. There were three sites, one in New York City, one in Isfahan, Tehran, and one in, um, sorry, one in Isfahan and one in Tehran. And um, we organized the conversations that would not only open up this channel or physical uh, so we could see each other through this uh, um, digital technology. But we also had other um, components that we um, developed in order to strengthen and enrich these, um, these conversations. So a touchstone for us for this uh, workshop was an essay by uh, Craig L. Wilkins, who's a scholar and an architect, um, called The Aesthetics of Equity. And in it, he discusses um, various definitions of the person in space. And um, it's written in a, at first in a very um, academic register, um, a typical scholarly text where he goes through four different thinkers and the way that they define how we engage with space and what a, what a classroom might be. So he talks about the philosophies of, of John Locke, of, um, uh, yeah, of John Locke, and then he moves 
all the way to bell hooks and then to himself. And he's drawing a line and, uh, between these different thinkers, but also challenging each of their conceptions of the, the human in space as he, as he goes on. Um, but what was especially moving to us and, and striking was that after he moves through his argument in this typical, um, using typical rhetorical devices, he has a remix section where he um, re-articulates his entire argument and condenses it into uh, three pages that instead of uh, taking the, um, the language of the academy, takes the language of black vernacular. And for him, as an African-American architect and scholar, it was really important not only to think about space in terms of physical spaces, where do people feel welcome, where do they feel uh, marginalized, but also in terms of language and poetics. So we're, what vocabularies do we feel um, welcomed by and included in, and what vocabularies do we feel um, marginalized by? So um, we want to share with you a reading that took place um, a couple of months ago, <laughs> where um, Craig was reading his uh, remix section, and Ava is reading a translation uh, into Farsi of this remix section. And we want to discuss afterwards some of the uh, challenges of not only um, uh, discussing such a text, but also even translating this sort of um, code switching from academic language to um, common vernacular. Okay, so I'm just going to get into this. So there, there's another way of looking at space, eh? Who knew? Actually, there's a shitload of ways, but first, let's look at old Lucky Boy again. He really believes that the only way you can know space is to touch or to see it. That's an interesting point, but is it really true? Let's take on Locke in his own hood. Let's say that his man in the dark is a big ass space with no light taken away. The only two ways Locke says you can know space, sight and touch. Can homeboy know or at least recognize space by any other way? Can he taste it? Nah. Smell it? Maybe, but that tells him more about what's in the space than what the space is. Can he hear it? Ah, oh, no, that's an interesting shit. Could he not get some kind of idea of where he is just by giving a shot? He might be able to hear an echo indicating a large space, or that shout might jump right off in his ear hole, small space. Or he might just hear a faint sound, huge space. In any case, he could, especially in the dark where he can't see, where walls are out of reach, where he can't touch, still have some sense of space, right? Oops, busted. So, if Locke ain't got his shit together, can we really believe that this locked out spatial theory? If not, we should look for a little something else. A little something something else. That might cover what old boy did. So, let's, up, let's sum up what he does cover. You know, Bafa, you're not digging your bar in the car and the fazo has. Nah. He's here, no, 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 no. Well, he has to see the kid, he's all has. اول همه یه نگاه دیگه بندازیم به این داستان این بابا لاک این لاکیلو تبعان زده که فضا رو فرام میشه لمسش کرد یا دیدش نوتش ریزه ها ولی درسته درست هم نیست یعنی نه که نه ولی طبق مثال خودش اگه همه جا تاریک باشه و لاکوچورو هم توی فضای گرد باشا تنه باشه چشش میبینه آخه که با دیدم فضا رو درک کنه یا دستش به جایی میرسه که فضا رو لمس کنه من موندم این جانلاق نمیتونست یه رویش نوین دیگه ای از خودش در کنه مثلا بچشه نه بو کنه شاید ولی با بو فقط میتونه بفهمه که چی تو فضاست نه اینکه فضا خودش چیه فرهاشو گرفتی حالا اینو داشته باش میتونه چی؟ بشنبه بله حال کردی میتونه بشنبه حالا شد یه داد بزنه میفهمه کجاست چقدر فضاش بزرگه مثلا اگه صداش برگرده به خودش میفهمه که فضا خیلی بزرگه یا اگه صداش بیفته دم گوش خودش میفهمه فضاش کوچیکه اگر فقط یه صدای ظریفی بشنبه میفهمه که فضا در نمیشه به هر حال میتونه یه ایده ای از فضا داشته باشه اگه نه که توی فضای تاری که نه میبینه نه دستش به جایی میرسه که کنش پارست که حالا اگه این خودش نمیدونه چه گوی بخوره ما رو چرا باید تو لاک خودش بکشه و حالا که ما به تئوری چرخش اعتقادی نداریم باید به قضیه یه حالت کار درستی بدیم 
بگیم آقا شما اینو ندیدیم اون لحظه که توش فضا شنا میکردیم این از چشم تو جا افتاد پس بیان یه بار دیگه ببینیم آقا این همه آسمون رسمی کرد اصلا چی بود Now it comes the fave saying that this space is what it is because we use it as so. So check this out. He says space is so because we do so. He alters lock like this. A classroom is a classroom because by teaching, we have actively made it space. John Locke says that the space is the same as we can describe it. یعنی هر انگی به فضا بزنیم همونه چیزی توی این مایا که فضا اینجوریه چون ما اینطور میگیم یعنی اگه بگیم فضا بین دو نقطه است شروع میکنیم به گشتن بین این دو تا نقطه دنبال یه چیزی که اسمشو بذاریم فضا یه کلاس درس کلاس درسه چون با نقشه مدرسه علامت روی در کلاس و مدل چیدن میزا سندلیا ما صریحا بهش برچسب کلاس درس داریم Then Hooks flips the script on Foucault by saying, as some of us do so here, and some of us do so there, not because we are forced to, but because we want to. So, yo, here we go. A classroom is a classroom because by teaching there, we have actively made it a space. But just because every classroom in the world ain't for everybody doesn't mean it all ain't good. Great. I think we were talking about bell hooks already. Is that right? Please, yes. Okay. And uh, you already have the text, so I think it would be better if we just use the time together rather than you passively watching the video. Mm -hmm. okay. Can you Great. say something really briefly about the context of what, where this was? And yeah, sure. sure. So um, this was a program uh, where we were speaking with Craig um, at Recess, which is a nonprofit art space in uh, Chinatown here. And um, yeah, so the, the event took place. Um, it was very exciting for us to finally have Craig physically there after spending several weeks discussing his text um, with participants in two different <laughs> cities in another country. Um, and so we had a, this sort of performative reading of the remix section where he read it in English and Ava read the translation in Farsi. Um, and then we uh, discussed um, examples of um, what he describes in the text as uh, celebratory heterotopias, so spaces that are um, marginalized spaces that have been sort of reclaimed by communities for various purposes. Um, and we're gonna talk more about that in this next session, um, some of the examples of these celebratory heterotopias that artists in Iran have also created, uh, that um, were artists who were participants in the workshop that we organized uh, this spring. Um, but the, we wanted to show this, so this is documentation, obviously, of the event, and you have the full, the full text in front of you. But we wanted to discuss this process of translating, and um, Ava wanted to discuss too briefly just the, um, the sense of uh, translating it to the Farsi and then the retranslation of performing it. Yes. And then we had some questions also for you. So basically, uh, it was very important for us to be able to have Craig to actually be a part of this program because the impact of this text for our program was very, very special. And the process of translating it was very interesting. We worked with translator Saleh Najafi uh, and he uh, basically translated the whole remix section in Farsi. And as you can imagine, the remix section is a very challenging uh, part of this uh, text to be translated to another language because it's in like a very specific uh, black vernacular which doesn't exist in the host language. So it was a very interesting conversation and process for us to be able to go through different words and different phrasing to be able to see what could actually be able to convey the uh, feeling and the meaning and the context that uh, Craig wanted to communicate, considering that this all has a very complicated historical and cultural background. Anyways, uh, through that whole process, we thought two examples could be useful for you to um, know about. And uh, also, if you guys have some specific ways that you uh, were kind of dealing with a text with your home language or another language that you speak, uh, that you want to share, that would be great that we could talk about that. What was the purpose of reading in Farsi? 
Uh, yeah, so this was very important for us to be able to uh, experience the act of reading it. And I tell you now why. Because uh, even after Saleh translated this text to Farsi, uh, I couldn't understand how provocative it can be for me to read it in my language, considering that this is not something that I would do. Just to give you some background, in Iran, the process of getting a, uh, um, a, uh, what, a, a certification or a confirmation for publishing something is very, very um, time consuming and complicated. And most of the time, depending on what is the content, you might not be able to get that. Uh, so you would never say this text in class? Exactly. Right and so it's just a matter of that, that not being able to read it in a public place, but also a matter of uh, the taboos of the culture, which is not only specific to Iran, as you know. There are many, many places that you might even not feel comfortable reading this text in English. But what I wanted to focus on was that when I was reading it in English before that session, I realized that there are some specific words and phrasing that actually could be said differently, and I didn't understand that. I didn't un get it until I read it loud. That was the moment I was like, okay, this could be translated a little bit different. That's true all writing. Yes. Even if you write in English. Exactly. Loud, so that very experience was uh, something else that was very important for this. So to just uh, tell you a little bit what we mean by this, and just to reemphasize on what Malib said a little bit before, the fact that Craig's was being very playful in the section of his text was very important for us to be able to have that flexibility to play with the wording and the language and the way that we want to receive it in a new language. So uh, two of the interesting moments for me, uh, which was also uh, impacted by the process of the eight-week workshop between these three places, was when uh, I realized that I'm very much interested in this idea of um, content and container and how you can switch containers and for one content from one language to another language. And then I realized that it's very interesting that, okay, in my language, uh, the shell of a turtle means lock in Farsi, yeah. as, you w the, as the way you exactly say it. So if I want in my language say, a turtle, I say, lock pushed. And a shell means lock. And for me, that could condense and visualize the whole theory of John Locke's dark room. <laughs> so that was the moment that I was like, great. So I can just use this word to be able to say John Locke's dark room theory. Right, and uh, just to contextualize the dark room theory of Locke for everyone, yes. that this was the starting point of Craig's essay, is describing John Locke's idea that when you walk into a, that a room only exists once a human walks into that room. And he describes the relationship between um, how you define yourself as a body in space and the dark room. So in the uh, scholarly section of the text, we translated it very, with a lot of fidelity. But in the second section, of us started getting much more playful. Yeah, so basically, as Molly said, it is important for you to know what we are talking about. Of course, sometimes I feel like people know things that I'm talking about, sorry about that. <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah, uh, just following that, also it was interesting to think of John Locke and the way that Craig's was talking about him as a turtle, which is kind of dehumanizing his character. And also the way that uh, Craig is talking about him in another section of the remix as this, you know, John little boy, but he also says like the old man. So he has this idea of John Locke that you think of him as a white, very old man that is talking about something that doesn't really make sense anymore because it's maybe too passe. So this all for me was kind of conveyed in this uh, phrasing and this translation of this part. I think I talked enough about this. If you have any questions, you can um, talk to me afterwards. But uh, the other part of it, which was uh, something very important for us and also for the whole programming was this very specific um, 
term that Craigs is using uh, for the way that he's uh, challenging the normative uh, spaces uh, and the way that he's defining marginalized spaces, he used this term uh, special making do. And this was another term that was crucial to under in order for people to understand, in order to be able to understand this uh, essay. So if we wanted to find the best way to translate it after conversations with Saleh and Mali together, we decided to translate this um, to a Farsi expression, which is uh, literally in English, burning and making, instead of uh, making do. So we picked burning and making, which is an expression in Farsi. And it's suhtan uh, and it uh, is basically uh, attributed to Sadi, uh, the medieval uh, poet from Iran. Uh, he's known as the first person who has ever used this expression in one of his uh, uh, poetries, which in English is, like a candle, I will become consumed by the morning. There's no other way by burning and making. So this has started to basically capture so many different meanings for us, this new container, which was also already connected to the network of other um, uh, concepts within the host language being the Farsi language. So it is a form of adaptation based on choice. So it automatically empowers you for choosing to do that adaptation. And it also refers to um, the act of metabolism. So it talks about a, it could be an organ or a space that is active rather than a prefixed. So that was uh, very important for us to be able to accomplish this um, moment within this translation. Yes. The, the difference between an institutional space, like a traditional classroom in a building, and these alternative spaces that you're describing is structure and expectation. Um, in a traditional uh, classroom space, uh, there is both structure and expectation. Uh, but in these alternative spaces that, that you're describing, there's neither structure nor expectation. And so how do these alternative spaces contribute to learning? That's a great question. Um, I think that these um, alternative spaces that we're describing, some of them, um, I guess there are sort of two species of spaces that we've been discussing and that came up during the eight week workshop. One is the sort of self gathering spaces that are temporary and constituted by the members who happen to be there at that moment. And these are often um, physical spaces for uh, open conversation uh, among artists and writers working in these different fields. Um, and they're in some ways also defined by, um, they're often adjacent to spaces that do have structure and expectation. So for example, when artists, a group of artists gathers um, to have a smoke on a balcony near an opening of an art exhibition, they know there are certain things that cannot be discussed inside the four mm -hmm. walls, but that in the more casual, friendly atmosphere um, over a joint prop, can be shared, um, or uh, more, uh, or more provocative political critique. In also, yeah, um, <laughs> but also gossip can lead to political unrest. Um, and another, um, and the other sort of species of space that we're talking about are um, spaces that uh, perhaps don't have a function that's directly related to um, to discourse but that have been abandoned or marginalized in various ways. Um, and Craig, in his text, he describes these as celebratory heterotopias or spaces that uh, people make do with and they bring other, um, they make, by virtue of these spaces having been outside of um, normative use or outside of commercial use, it allows for sort of a, a freedom of movement and um, a freedom of activity that um, that people can intervene into. I also think, I mean, having been a part of some of the um, the workshops, the the intimacy that um, that is really present in having conversations with 
artists over this very far distance through a kind of, you know, the sketchy um, predictability of the internet and all of this. Um, there is a sense of um, there's a sense of a need to create a shared space of intimacy and trust. And that came up when Karen and I were talking about what constitutes a classroom, is finding that space of safety, of feeling like one can trot out unusual ideas or ideas that might not be connected to the larger kind of power structures that might be forming the uh, authorized classrooms or the authorized places of convening. And so I think that um, these alternative spaces in that sense can, um, can constitute where, um, where the unauthorized storytelling happens. And I think that in a way, um, you know, uh, part of what I find so fascinating about what you guys are doing is kind of creating that space um, across a much larger distance and allowing additional participation in that in a way that's very powerful. I mean, per my experience, in any case. One, one, I've not read the painted word. Oh, it's a famous book by <laughs> Travis. Uh, um. That would be great if we talk about it later because I think we're running out of time. I just wanted to add something following what uh, Lara said. So, I think it's very hard to talk about a program like the one that we are doing in such a short amount of time, but to just give you some background of it, which is, we're gonna talk about it more in the next section, but I think this is necessary to maybe mention it now, is that for us it's very important that this level of intimacy and direct access is equally available for both sides. So it is very important that imagine people like yourself who might know about Iran but might not necessarily be able to have brainstorming or collaboration or sharing sessions for sharing ideas or discourses with uh, experts of your field being in that country, this could be a place that you could actually consider being able to have those kind of conversations in order to uh, be able to have access to what is maybe not there for you. And this is something that is uh, very important to just consider, that this is uh, being two ways in a very, very um, structured way. Um, one, one other thing, oh wow, geez, hello. Um, about the, connecting back to what uh, Laura said about um, how to create the methods for creating such a feeling of shared space and uh, communication across such distances. I think this um, comes back to the importance of translation and the translation of texts um, because we found as we were starting to have conversations with um, artists in Iran uh, when we first began organizing programming four years ago that um, one of the great difficulties was not necessarily um, being understood in the most basic sense, you know, Ava and Others were working as simultaneous translators, um, but also developing a shared vocabulary, and a shared vocabulary that was not only rested in either American English or Western philosophy, but also had some you know, uh, engaged roots in Farsi and pulled from other uh, intellectual traditions. And um, one writer that was sort of useful for me is Sian Ngai, who's a She's a literary theorist, and uh, she has a book called Ugly Feelings, and she describes um, in poetics the idea of thickness when we think about language, that a word can thicken as it's been repeated, as it's been used in multiple contexts, and that a word carries with it all of these other meanings and references. And, um, you know, in her, when she describes it, she's thinking more about, like, Gertrude Stein and, and modernists who, you know, uh, have strategies for thickening language. But um, this keeps coming up in my mind as I'm thinking about how we are creating a shared vocabulary or a shared context with the artists that we're working with, that in fact we're also creating a, a thickening here that as we translate a word, um, anytime we find, we try to translate a word or a phrase, of course we lose some of the thickness of that word as it's being transmitted. <laughs> some of the meanings carry, but not all of them, not all of the the associations that we might have from a literary tradition, from popular culture, from uh, conversations that we've had. And then as soon as it takes on another term in that new language, it is thickened again, but by very different references that may or may not 
be related to the original source. And so I think that the, the turtle shell is a good example of how we're trying, we're aware of this, the other um, accidental layers that get glommed on to words when they're translated, but we want to do it in a sort of thoughtful and playful way and not pretend that it's not happening. So um, as we move forward, we're um, trying to translate a sort of network of texts so that we can not only have single um, reference points for some of these concepts for the artists that we're working, but they can also be sort of situated in a constellation of ideas. And just to finish with this uh, other important uh, aspect of this work, and it's how this translation and uh, process of workshops are connected to each other. So the text is translated beforehand. It's accessible for the people who are coming to the workshops. For instance, for the last workshop, we had eight sessions between Esfahan, Tehran, and New York. And that text allows us to start to share new and mutual experiences around this new vocabulary and think about this content and this vocabularies with this shared experiences. So that's something that is becoming very important to how we are focusing on this new definitions that <laughs> this uh, meanings or this vocabulary evokes for us based on that shared experience. I have a question about um, the importance of enacting the language because it sounds really absolutely wonderful that one would share texts and read them together and you know after translations but it seems so important that you physically enact and speak those texts and it's really to me very interesting this this um, difference between a physical presence and experience vis-a-vis um, -vis the internet and the online um, connection that is anything but physical so I wonder if you could comment a little bit on how you expand and extend um, on that sense of community that I imagine comes from being in a space speaking a language that may not be your own even, you know, from one workshop to the next, for instance. Well, it's not your language, so you want to talk oh. first? <laughs> um, actually, it just comes to mind um, recently, just I guess a couple months ago, there was a book that came out called The Dictionary of Untranslatables. Um, and it was um, edited by Barbara Kassen, and, um, and it's a dictionary of 400 philosophical terms that um, have no direct translation. And um, the challenge of the book is then to contextualize each of these terms in a, as kaleidoscopic a <laughs> way as possible, I guess, in a, in a, in a condensed space. And, um, so we were really excited about this book, obviously. Um, but there were a few phrases that came in uh, that we, that they discussed that, um, that felt so relevant. Um, and one was, every author and the philosopher is an author simultaneously writes in a language and creates his or her own language. The relationship between author and language is that he is its organ and it is his. And I think this idea of, um, being this sort of evolving organ ourselves and with language, it felt very resonant because when we're in that room and uh, trying to force that or feel that intimacy between all these groups and speaking and it's most of it is going in and out of Ava's brain and back and forth. Uh, this is something that is sort of visual that we've laughed about and discussed before. I think Laura, it was even you who yeah. maybe said that in the room it feels like Ava's the sci-fi movies of like this enormous brain under a glass. glass and you see all the activity coming in and out. So Maybe it's important to just give you an idea of what you're talking about. Just me not, you know, <laughs> imagine you know what's going on. So imagine we're sitting here right this, but we have two projectors right there. One is like one city, one is the other city. And most of the time, the internet is not helping that much. So sometimes we, are, we don't have a good connection. Sometimes we have to repeat, as, like one of the sessions that Lara was with us, we just ended up repeating and repeating and repeating one comment for an 
half an hour, basically, to make sure that everybody understands what we are talking about, or if someone else making a comment, the other uh, part, the side are understanding it. So this takes a lot of back and forth in between these three locations, making sure that everybody understands. And we also have coordinators and uh, communicators in each location who are also connected with us through a totally different s uh, setup to let us know what is the temperature of the room, what is actually happening, and if something is not totally uh, convened from one side to another. So it's a very um, kind of uh, crazy situation, <laughs> complicated process. Maybe this was helpful for you to understand it. Thank you. I was just wondering about the process of translation, being very interested in what you said about the um, sort of traveling of <coughs> words and ideas from a context to the next and thickening, et cetera. I was wondering how, how much back and forth there is in that process, and also just in very, in very specifically about these workshops that you did, um, and the extent to which each person, each language and each voice and each vernacular was heard on both sides. I mean, I have some experience with Arabic context, Arabic and English, for instance. And oftentimes, in terms of the art context and uh, the texts being translated, it often goes one way. Sort of there's some kind of knowledge that's in English that needs to be injected into Arabic, Farsi, whatever. Um, so it was, you know, just in terms of the conversations, in terms of the texts, and I was just thinking about it also in terms of this text, the Wilkins text. So I was wondering if this remix session is at the end of the book. Is there only one remix session? Um, if not, then what happens after the remix session in the book? I mean, in the sense, the remix session is a way to sum up with this lingo all the academic conversations that's happened in the book before. But then, does his academic language become influenced with? having gone through the remix afterwards. I mean, is that, does that back and forth, can, can that happen, and how? So to go back to your first question uh, of translation in terms of the process of the workshop, and also for having it as an equal two-way, right? Okay, so during the workshops, we were kind of welcoming the participants also to uh, allow them to come up with words and terms for the program. This happened through a shared Google document. So we had the whole uh, remix section translated in Farsi. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I'm just really focused on remix. No, the whole uh, excerpts that we have taken from uh, Craig's um, text was translated into Farsi, including the remix section. And uh, they were able to make comments on it, highlight it, and uh, use it as a common place to uh, basically discuss the text together. And uh, we also uh, had uh, this question of how you read the special making do. What does this mean to you? And um, we kind of dedicated the, um, um, the uh, Facebook image of the workshop to be images of different wordings that the participants come up with for the term special making do. Having that said, uh, for the translation of text also, we have started to gather a community of translators within Iran and also uh, here in New York. And we are uh, talking to these people in terms of being able to, as Molly mentioned, to create this network of concepts translated from one language to another as an organ. The way that I understand it myself is if you wanna do an operation of taking out you know, an organ, putting it in another uh, person's body, it's a connection of many different uh, particles that you cannot mess up with. So have that in mind. Also imagine that for translating this, they, therefore, the, there is a need of having so many other texts to be translated beforehand. For instance, we wanted to translate uh, bell hooks. Now we know that for black, translating bell hooks, there are many other texts that needs to be translated beforehand. And then through the community of our translators, we know that, okay, there is one specific translator who can handle this because she has done texts who has been 
uh, who's uh, texts that are kind of connected to this, and she would be able to let us know what is the next entry point, entry point to come <laughs> with. And then from this side also, to make, king, uh, to make sure that we are not only doing it from English to Farsi, to just kind of do fair to people here as well, to understand what's going on there. Uh, we uh, are working with uh, different um, colleagues uh, as well as uh, specific uh, contexts that we are excited to translate. This is the next project of the back room. We are working on uh, this now, just to let you know. Molly and I are working on this um, series of um, a publication called Friday Book, which ha was a quarterly uh, published in Iran uh, right before the revolution, for less than a year. After the revolution, actually. Right before, in within, and right after. So like that kind of uprising time. So when I say before the revolution, this is how I see a revolution when it's dead. <laughs> so it's before it and when it's the uprising and then right after it's vacuumed, right? Yes. Uh, the In the 70s. People's Revolution, but of course it was, it had a different uh, destiny. <laughs> but uh, just to, let you know that perhaps for this conversation we were not focused that much on those texts, but this is something that if you're interested to know more about Backroom's activities, we can let you, uh, you know, kind of be involved. I just want to check on time with Laura and Karen. Okay. No, I just wanted to share with you a little bit of my experience about translation. Um, because in this project I'm um, facilitating in Italy, we are a group of uh, Italians, uh, Iranian, uh, Indians, um, Italian that only speak French as a second language, and uh, English or North American participants. So very often the question of language becomes, uh, it's a qu there are Armenians too. Um, so. Of course, we have the privilege to share the same room, and our back room, it's a home, because this project is centered exactly on the topic, uh, how we can learn differently, collectively, and for us, uh, that was uh, sharing a home, creating this intimacy of a um, protected uh, space, uh, like you would do in a home. So everything happened like this, we live together and uh, we learn together. Uh, this is uh, central, but we started, I mean, this, uh, this problem of translation, of course, was <laughs> evident from, from the first session where we hired translators. So whoever of us uh, could uh, manage to be in different language would uh, provide a translation for everybody else. But with hiring professional translators, no matter where, how professional they were, there was always something missing. Nobody could really, uh, translate either the very intense conversation that we may have or the way we read book together and we comment on book and sometimes we read just one page over and over and that's our exercise. So little by little after five, six times we met and gathered, what happened is that we really developed a practice of translation of the translation. And somehow we don't hire any more professional translators. We, each of us, translate for each other in small group or in, uh, thank you, or in uh, just one take the turn for everybody else. There is a patience that needs to be developed. Like we all struggle a little bit, but even in this uh, exercise of uh, giving yourself time and waiting, and just as you were saying, just even observing how another language embodies uh, or perform some, uh, some concept, you know, whatever your rational understanding is getting, but that process is also bringing you something else. And it's especially bringing you something that the person that is talking is trying to pass over. So it's not only just this idea of literal translation or interpretation of a text, but is also, you know, our own understanding of 
whatever we are discussing and how you share that, that can be done differently. It's a perfect uh, transition. Thank you to, um, one thing we thought we could just leave you with for some subway reading. Um, so I'm, we're passing out just a, it's a photocopy from a 2006 issue of Harper's Magazine. But um, in it you can see there's an, um, in their reading section where they have excerpts taken from other uh, texts and um, visual content um, is this column that says keep dreaming. And what they did is they um, took a, chose a poem by Samuel Beckett from 1978 um, that goes, oh, forgive my poor French accent, Rêve sans fin ni trêve à rien. And they then published seven different translators' attempt to capture this brief and melancholic <laughs> poem. And, um, I think it's interesting even to look and decide for yourselves which is your, your favorite and does that favorite um, attempt at some fidelity to the original, does it play in its own right with English as Beckett does in French? Um, and, and which ones fail? Translation of Beckett himself? Yeah, there was no uh, Beckett. Tr <laughs> this one was written in French, but yeah, that's a really good point. And I think uh, it's very to the point too that he didn't want to trust others <laughs> with that act. Why he didn't do it? <laughs> well, Ava and Molly, thank you so much. We're going to take a little break now. There's snacks and coffee and wine, and water and fruit. So please join us, and then we'll, we'll continue at 7. We'll start again.